And that's all that I have to say here in the role of the person doing the welcome speech. Um, but I now also have the pleasure of acting as the session chair for our keynote. Um, so the topic here will, will be coming from, or the, the way I prefer to look at it is, uh, we all are used to working with our algorithms and then turning our algorithms into code, have a compiler turn that down into machine code, um, and then run that on devices. Um, that is the way that we are used to because we are working in a relatively open environment. Um, this is not always the case, and there are lots of um, IoT devices that are running on closed source firmware, but we can still learn a lot of them um, thanks to the work that Sebastian Schrittwieser um, is doing on, algori on, algorithmic reconst on reconstruction of algorithms from binary images. So, welcome Sebastian. Please take the stage. Can, can you see it in remote? Good. Okay, then uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, yeah, thank you for, in, for inviting me to this, uh, to this event. I have to admit, I'm, I'm new to, to Riot OS and um, this amazing community and I'm, I'm really happy to uh, give you in this keynote um, my perspective on, on, on IoT uh, um, and IoT software, firmware from, from the other side. So, um, a little bit about me. So, um, I'm from the University of Vienna. I'm senior scientist, um, you know, at, at the university in a research group, uh, security and privacy. So, we focus on what, what, what bad could happen, uh, yeah, with, with computing systems. And one important aspect, of course, is software. And I specialized on, on software security. So I'm also heading um, a so-called Christian Doppler laboratory uh, on assurance and transparency of software protections. So what we do is we apply uh, software protections to code. I will come to this uh, later on, uh, what, what exactly we do here, and I will show it also in the context of, uh, of IoT devices and, uh, and software running on them. And I'm also a key researcher at SBA Research, um, which is um, yeah, an independent, uh, independent from the university's uh, research center that focuses on security and privacy aspects. Yeah, my primary focus is software security. So, yeah, looking at code, understanding this code, um, reverse engineering it, uh, but on the other side also protecting it against these reverse engineers. Um, also digital forensics, um, mostly uh, in the area of, uh, of code again. So what can we figure out from uh, what, what happened uh, in, uh, in algorithmically in, in code? And um, yeah, I'm also, like many of you, maybe fascinated by, by LLMs and the security aspects uh, of them is also an important research topic for me nowadays. So yeah, let's go into, into topic and just move around. Yeah, what, what, what's, what's our problem with, uh, with IoT firmware? We see uh, quite often analysis is a mess, basically. So um, binary code analysis is really hard, is really time consuming, and uh, it's really, really difficult to identify specific functionality in there. But um, 
quite often this is important. So for example, think of, of malware research. So you, you get this IoT device, you maybe you're running it into your in, in your own home network, and you don't really know what this code does. And um, it could uh, maybe install yeah, something, uh, a crypto miner, or something, something bad that you don't want to have in your, uh, in, in, in your home network. So you want to figure out wh what it does. Does it more than it promises? And how is it implemented? Are there security vulnerabilities? And so on. And uh, the same for, for, for malware research. So uh, we get hundreds of thousands of new samples uh, each day. And we don't really know what, what these samples actually do, what their functionality is. And it would be really great to have uh, automatic um, systems, algorithms that, that find out what the core functionality is, um, that can unhide um, hidden functionality that is uh, somewhere stored in the binary and triggered on some special input and so on. And yeah, in, in firmware forensics, we basically do exactly this. So we have a binary blob of some, some firmware. We have not really an idea what it does. Of course, we have observable behavior. So if it's a security camera and it takes videos uh, through the hardware, we know, yeah, that's basically some of the functionality. It will maybe have some, some, some API that, uh, that we see, but we don't really know what, what is else hidden uh, in there. And so mostly we know the core functionality, but uh, a lot of hidden functionality could be in there, like backdoors, crypto miners, ransomware. Uh, devices can, can phone uh, home and send uh, maybe sensitive data back to the, to the vendor and so on. So we have seen uh, all of these things uh, in the wild uh, in the past, uh, past years. And of course, manual forensics of binary code as I said, is hard, is time consuming. So what can we do to uh, make, it, make it faster uh, and um, yeah, give you, provide uh, automatic uh, algorithms that can somehow uncover hidden functionality from which we know a little bit of. So today I want to present uh, two things. The one is uh, identifying flow dependent functionality I will come to this in a moment, but this is, for example, typically a backdoor. And the other thing is uh, identifying known algorithms. So for example, we know AES works like this. This is a publicly known algorithm. Uh, we would like to identify it in code without really knowing how it's implemented in detail. So the first thing, the um, uh, flow-dependent functionality, here the idea is that we basically describe what we're looking for based on, on, on a reachability problem inside the control flow uh, of, the, of the program. So we don't know how it is implemented, but we know that if we find a path through the program um, that, that, that follows a specific uh, rules, then we know, for example, this is bad, this could be a backdoor. So, very, very simple example. We have um, this control flow uh, of, of, of a program and uh, different functions or, uh, or blocks, no uh, matter on which level of detail we are in here, but it works uh, uh, in both ways. And the idea is we have some kind of author, uh, authentication routine where we usually um, yeah, ask for for example, for credentials, and uh, only after uh, the credentials were given and they were checked being correct, uh, we can go, for example, to the admin area of this, of this device, of this software. And if we now find a way through the program from the beginning, from the init, uh, to the admin area without going through auth, then this has to be some kind uh, of vulnerability or on-purpose uh, authentication bypass, so a backdoor for example. So the question here is just, do we find this way? And this can be done automatically. I will come to this in more detail later on, but first let's look at uh, the second problem we have. It's about known algorithms. So for example, the crypto algorithm we're looking for. So we search 
for an algorithm. We know algorithmically how it works, but we don't know how it is implemented. And this could be, for example, an AS algorithm where we don't know how it is uh, synthet syntactically implemented. So, for example, what are the sequences of instructions in binary code uh, we have here? So we can't really look for them because we don't know how it will look like in the compiled binary. So what we can now do is we can describe this algorithm based on input-output behavior. So we know if some input, input is some clear text in this case, and some key um, is sent to this algorithm, we know how the ciphertext should look like. And with this input-output matching, we can identify algorithms without knowing exactly how they are implemented. Again, I will come to this uh, in a moment. So what kind of um, methods we now have for, for, for binary uh, analysis? What could help us for, for doing exactly these two kind of searches in, uh, in binaries? We can uh, execute a binary, um, run it on, on the corresponding hardware and observe it. We can emulate it. We have to write an emulator. We have to <laughs> have an emulator, of course, for, um, for the architecture. Um, symbolic execution, we'll come to this uh, later on in more detail, is also a, a possibility where we evaluate the program's behavior on symbolic values instead of uh, concrete ones. And uh, we can simulate uh, the program based on some kind of model that we describe from the reality, from, from the real hardware and software. So program execution uh, for, for forensic analysis, um, it's, it's the easiest uh, way of yeah, doing um, yeah, dynamic analysis on, on, on code. So we run it on the corresponding hardware. Um, if possible, we try to control uh, it at runtime in some, some way. So we can try to, to, to uh, attach a debugger, for example, or use a profiler uh, to get a little bit more information about um, the, the, the execution of the, of the device. Of course, this is not always possible. We can not always attach a debugger on some, some device we have. So it depends on, uh, on the whole uh, system and yeah, hardware and software. Um, of course, it's the best approximation of how this software will uh, behave in the real world. Um, maybe not 100% of what it will do in the real world. It always depends on some external things like, um, yeah, it could behave differently in another network or uh, if some devices are attached or not. Also, attaching a, a debugger and, for example, setting software breakpoints will modify the software. This can be detected. So it's not 100% the same like it's running in the wild, but still. And um, yeah, limitations are, you don't really know, uh, sometimes you, you can't really access the, uh, the, the, the environment where uh, the, the system should be running. And you have limited coverage, of course. So you can run it. Uh, you see um, the behavior that gets executed, the functionality that gets executed, but of course, nothing more. So for example, if there's hidden functionality, a backdoor, and this backdoor is not triggered, and you don't know how to trigger it, you won't observe it. And it will, be, will stay hidden for you as an analyst. On the other hand, in emulation, uh, you interpret the code in an emulated environment um, instead of running it in the real hardware. Um, ideally, it behaves like the real hardware. Of course, it's always an abstraction and it won't behave 100% like, like the real hardware, but it has to be good enough. Um, you have much more control over the execution environment, of course. It depends on your um, emulator, uh, of what, what, what it does, what it um, profiles, uh, where it stops, and so on. Uh, limitations, of course, um, yeah, it's only as good as your emulator and the emulator has to exist for this architecture. And um, again, limited coverage. So you emulate it, but you don't really know if you trigger the unknown um, uh, functionality, for example. Third thing uh, or method is symbolic execution. Um, 
it's quite an old concept from the 70s. Um, the basic idea or the main idea is that um, at any point during uh, a runtime of a, of a program, you can express the values of all variables uh, through a function or as a function of the original value. And uh, you go through the program and always calculate or recalculate uh, or recreate these, these functions of all the of all the values. So, and the, the thing is now that you that you interpre uh, interpret the program with these symbolic values instead of the concrete ones. So, at one specific point um, during execution, um, you don't say that variable a is ten but it could be in the range, for example, from 0 to 50. And uh, with this, you can um, reason about a whole class uh, of, of possible input combinations uh, without uh, doing them all separately. And this is actually used in practice quite a lot. For example, Microsoft says that 30% uh, of the bugs they discover um, are actually yeah, discovered with the help of symbolic execution. And there are many, many different tools uh, that can be used for this. Uh, we'll have a look at Anger uh, in a moment, uh, one of the open source tools uh, that can be used for, for symbolic execution. Just to give you a little bit of understanding on, on, on how this works, and so that you get an understanding of what we do in a moment, um, because we'll reverse engineer a, a small program uh, with the help of anger and symbolic execution. Basically, it, it works like this, that um, you have the program inputs and they are not re represented as, um, as concrete values, but as symbols. That's the first step. And each symbol uh, uh, presents uh, a value range for the different um, variables. And then the program statements then generate formulas over these, uh, over these symbols. So you just basically replace the variables with these um, symbols. And then when you go through the program uh, or the, the, the instructions, the sequences of instructions, you recalculate these formulas. We'll have a look in a moment. And then, of course, uh, it's not always um, a sequence of instructions. We also have branches. And uh, when we have, um, for example, a conditional branch that depends on some variable, um, we consider um, each possible uh, path. So in this case, uh, i can be uh, smaller than 5 or 5 and bigger. Uh, with this, we have two paths that we uh, have to have to analyze uh, later on. And uh, this basically uh, generates something that is called a path constraint. So you can only go in this direction if, for example, the symbolic value um, is smaller than five. And then at each point in time, we have execution state, which basically is the statement, the next one that gets interpreted. Um, and then we have the symbolic store that stores all the symbolic uh, values. and then we have a variable that stores uh, all the path constraints. And in the end, when we have all these formulas, we can um, ask ourselves, is it possible to reach a certain point in a program um, with certain inputs? And um, this is basically just that we want to figure out if a path constraint is satisfiable. And for exactly this, um, uh, this, this can then be used uh, for things like, to, uh, for example, in, um, in, in finding, finding a bug. Uh, it could be uh, we want to look if array access is out of bounds at some point with some specific input value. And um, yeah, we can define this as is there a path through the program where we come to a point um, where this i is smaller than zero or uh, bigger than the length of the array. And um, in the symbolic store, we, we can go uh, through, the, uh, through the program and have a valid path constraint to this point where this is actually the case for the variable i. And um, we don't have to do this manually. There are um, methods for this, uh, like uh, set or, and SMT solvers. And um, basically, they are provided with a well-formed uh, formula 
for the set solver, it's uh, propositional logic, and then we have to decide if there is uh, if there are input values uh, that, or that if there's a satisfying solution for this. This is also something that was developed uh, a long time ago in the, in, in the in the 60s. Now we can we can use it for uh, symbolic execution, which is great. And basically, the, the difference between a, a set solver and the SMT solver is that, um, that, that the set solver is, is Boolean logic, and the SMT solver uh, now is uh, much more powerful as it uh, uses first order logic and includes things like constants and uh, functions and predicate symbols and so on. And um, it's great, we have um, an open source uh, SMT solver, uh, set uh, three was open sourced in 2015. And uh, in this, for example, we can declare two, um, two constants, uh, A and B, and then we say um, that there are two assertions. Uh, the one is uh, A plus B is 20, and the other one is two times B um, plus A is 10. And now we want to find out, is there a valid solution for this? Uh, so we check the satisfiability of this and get the model. And uh, set three will return us that for B, the value has to be minus 10, and for A, the value 30. And then it's satisfiable. It doesn't have to be the, own, uh, the, the only solution, but this is one, one valid so solution. If there's no solution, it will will tell us that it's not satisfiable. And now let's, let's use this in uh, symbolic execution. So we have uh, a very simple uh, program here that we want to, to analyze um, with symbolic execution. So we have this algorithm, and now uh, we go through the entire algorithm and uh, symbolize uh, all the input values. So at the beginning, we have yeah, the two input values, uh, uh, variables uh, x and y, and we symbolize them as a and b. And now we go step by step uh, through this algorithm, through, through the code, and um, take the formulas and uh, recalculate them for each, for each step. So the first thing we now have is a branch, a conditional branch. So we have an if statement. So it can go in, in two directions, depending on if x is bigger than y or not. So uh, we have these two uh, different um, uh, paths that, that, that we create. And um, if we now look at the, at the next line, so where uh, x is set to x plus y, um, yeah, if, 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 if a is smaller or equal than b, then we are at this, uh, this return. So this is, this is finished, and the other path, uh, we say, okay, x is now not a anymore, but a plus b, and y stays the same, stays b. Then in the next line, y is x minus y. We have to look in the, um, in the line before, uh, x was a plus b, and now it's um, a plus b minus b. Um, which means, uh, so, so y, which means that uh, this is then a, and so on. We go through the entire program, and then again, we have um, a, a branch, and we set all the different um, formulas for uh, each step in this, um, in this control flow graph now for this. And now, when we have this uh, symbolized values, we can ask this uh, SMT solver uh, to uh, solve, for example, uh, reachability problems. Can I go at some point where A is something like this and so on? There are quite a few challenges uh, in practice for this. So, for example, how to um, yeah, create a memory model. How should it look like? Um, environment interaction is also a problem, so how to interact with, with a network, for example. And uh, path explosion is maybe the biggest uh, one we, we have. So w w at, at every branch, uh, we have to consider uh, an additional path. And um, yeah, too many possible paths um, will then 
yeah, we will run into, into limited uh, computing resources at some point, we can't solve this anymore. And um, in, in practice, we can use some knowledge we have about the program uh, to limit path explosions. So for example, if we know the size uh, of, of variables or the ranges that, that could be in, then we can uh, limit, for example, uh, this, the symbolic stores a little bit. We can use concrete values at some points uh, if, this is, uh, uh, if this is possible and so on. And we can also um, uh, prioritize interesting path and say we want to ignore others. We'll do all of this in, in a moment. One additional important aspect is concolic execution. You will hear a lot about this when you, for example, work with Anger. Uh, the basic idea is that you combine concrete and symbolic uh, execution. So it's basically static and dynamic analysis. And the key concept is you run the code with concrete values, which is fast. You get one path, you record it, and then you symbolize uh, all the variables in the, uh, in the trace. Um, choose one branch, um, also look at the other uh, side, negate it, and uh, generate new input values, restart um, by, by running the code again with these new values and so on. So this is then much faster and um, yeah, you can, you have, you have one, one solver query basically for, for, for each path and it reduces the probability that you get stuck and can't solve it anywhere uh, at, at some point because of path explosions and so on. And uh, sometimes you can exploit concrete values to solve hard constraints. So for example, in this um, code, code snippet, it, this is hard to solve if both of the variables are um, symbolic, but easy if one is uh, concrete and the other one is symbolic. Why I'm talking about this, because Anger uses um, symbolic and concolic execution. So, um, the, 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 the Anger framework is basically um, a, a toolkit for binary analysis, can a little bit more than just symbolic execution. It, it's Python-based and is developed by um, a, a very, very famous research group uh, at the UCSB in Santa Barbara um, under the guidance of, of Professor Krügel, who is originally from uh, the TU to EU Vienna. And uh, there was also a DARPA um, Cyber Grand Challenge in 2016, where um, the, the goal was to to find vulnerabilities automatically and patch them automatically. And Anger was also part of one of the team's uh, bigger bigger framework for for, for this system. Uh, it uses uh, Set three as a um, as a theorem solver, SMT solver, and um, yeah, let's look how this uh, works then in, in, in practice for firmware, uh, for firmware forensics. So we now uh, try to identify flow-dependent uh, functionality, so, so backdoors. And basically in Anger, this is, this is pretty simple and just a few lines of code. So um, the task is you want to find a path through the binary uh, from the starting point to the target. So, for example, to the admin area from the init without going through um, the, the, the authentication. So, we just choose a starting point. Um, can be the entry point of the program. Doesn't have to be. Depends on, uh, for example, if something really, really time consuming happens at the beginning uh, with a lot of path, then it's maybe not a good idea to, to just start at the beginning, but maybe jump uh, in a little bit further. Um, then you choose the target point. That's, for example, the admin area. Um, then you define points you don't want to come by. So that's our authentication. Um, this is also great because it limits the way of um, the, the number of possible paths. And uh, then you define uh, the symbolic inputs and try to solve this. And if you find a solution, you will get concrete input values that you have to use to, to get there. And this was uh, done by the research group that developed Anger. Uh, this was basically their first, um, first result uh, using Anger. It's, it's called Firmalize, and they detected authentication bypasses, exactly the ones I presented before, um, in binary firmware through symbolic execution. So they used not only symbolic execution, but also concolic with concrete values that it's faster. Um, they had three devices with known backdoors. So 
to figure out if this works. Uh, so the, the first thing was a, a security camera which had hard-coded credentials. So at some point it was, if the password is something, then bypass. Uh, the second one was a smart meter that had a back door that was at least, let's say, <laughs> dynamically uh, generated through the, the serial number of the device. So it was not really hard-coded, but still, uh, if you knew uh, how to use it, you were able to bypass uh, authentication. And uh, the last one was a, um, a printer, a laser printer, and the backdoor was triggered by sending a specially crafted um, packet over the network. So really something uh, that is really, really good um, hidden, uh, really well hidden, and uh, you won't find it without yeah, uncovering this hidden functionality, understanding the functionality, uh, and uh, yeah, finding out how these network packets must be crafted to, to find it. And yeah, as you can see, for the results, it worked for, um, for, for all three devices. All the backdoors were uh, identified just by looking for a valid path. Um, as you can see, um, symbolic execution is not fast. So for the, uh, for the printer, uh, it took them uh, over 700 minutes to run uh, through this, but still it, it's feasible with uh, today's uh, computing uh, power and uh, absolutely possible to find these kind of, of vulnerabilities. And um, 700 minutes is maybe uh, too long to, to, to run it now, but uh, let's have a look together at um, one, one real world example. Uh, and um, yeah, live demos are usually a little bit risky, but uh, let's see how, how it works out. So what we have here is uh, a very simple uh, program a key generator, and you basically run it uh, by, uh, with one argument. It has to be some, some password. And uh, if you know the, 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 um, the password, if you know the correct password, then it will show you access granted or something. And if you don't know it, uh, then it will say, no, get, get out or so. So uh, the basic thing is that we would like to find out this, this hard-coded string that is somewhere in this binary um, to, uh, that we have to provide to this binary so that uh, it, it, it grants us the access. And we solve this by uh, defining the symbolic input as just one input, the, the password that we provide. Um, the starting point will just use the entry point of the program uh, and the target point. The target point will be uh, the message that is printed that we get access. We'll also define uh, things that we would like to avoid. That's basically uh, the point where it says, nope, get out of here. And then we search for valid path from this one point to the target point without going through uh, the nope section. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Like this. That's the binary, binary code. So um, not very nice uh, for analysis. What we have, uh, we see all the functions. Um, we at least have the names of these functions, or most of them, so we have uh, a lot of different checks. And uh, we also see something like uh, denied access over here. So a little bit of understanding of the program, yeah, is, yeah, we can already retrieve from, from looking at the functions. Then um, let's um, decompile it first. That's exactly what you have seen on the, on the slide before. That's how this algorithm works. Um, it takes the input and then um, checks uh, that the length of it, and uh, if it doesn't work, uh, it, it will uh, go to this, to this access denied. And then it will run um, a total of, of 14 uh, different checks. And only if all of them um, work, uh, then uh, we'll get this access granted uh, plus some, some, some hidden code. And we can also look inside one of these checks 
it does something that you don't want to analyze uh, manually. A lot of yeah, moving around uh, of values. And in the end, you can see uh, it's access denied um, if it's not the correct input value. So this is really, really time consuming uh, to go through. But yeah, we can use symbolic execution to find the path and then go back and, and ask for the, for the input values. So. Let's look at the code itself. We know we have an, uh, an entry point. We don't care about this. This can be defined in Angular. But we have to find two, two addresses. The one we want to avoid, and the other one we want to, to reach. And um, basically, it's, um, it's the location where um, a print is done, and uh, some, yeah, some message is, is, is printed. So let's look first at access denied. What you can see here is that we have the value, the Snope uh, access denied. And at some point, uh, we call the printf. So that's our location um, that we want to avoid. So at 400, 760, uh, that's the location we, we like to avoid. And now let's look at, at the other one uh, we want to, to find. It has to be somewhere over there. And so we have, uh, again, OK, X is granted. And uh, after that, there's the call for the printf where we want to go. So it's at 41A5A. That's what we want to find. And now let's code this um, search uh, with anger. And yeah, let's run it. So maybe we run it first. Um, it's called keychain. It's not really a key generator. Yeah, it will provide us a key, but yeah. Uh, and some password. Of course, it was not the correct one. Was anyone already able to figure out what the real password was? By just looking at the code? Maybe not. Can have another one. Nope, doesn't work. Let's uh, do this in anger. Um, it's written in Python, so we just import anger. Uh, we also need Clarify, um, which is the solver engine uh, that is used uh, by, by anger. Then we create a new project. Not bad, Copilot. But of course, it's called Keychain. Also not, also not bad. What you can see here is uh, that the load options auto load libs false. Um, if we set this to true, uh, then we would load uh, external system libraries, like for example for the for the printf, which will take forever. We just um, emu uh, simulate them. Um, we replace them by Python um, code, uh, which is mass much faster and works in in our example. Okay, um, now we have the pro uh, um, project. Now we need uh, to symbolize uh, the input values. Uh, we don't really know how big the input is. Uh, we make it at least as big as we expected. Um, so in our case, we create um, a symbolic um, bit vector, uh, which we call, for example, argument one. Not bad, but we make it 128 big. This, this should be enough. And then we uh, need to define an initial state. Looks good. Uh, so we define initial state from the project. Uh, we take uh, the entry state, the entry point in the program, and uh, we call it uh, with uh, with the argument uh, one. 
Now we need a simulation manager. Simulation manager basically helps us finding uh, this path, doing the symbolic execution. Uh, we call it SM, uh, simulation initial state on the initial state. Everything is great. And now we want to explore um, the code. Uh, we want to find something. Of course, this is not correct anymore. Um, we wanted to find something at 40 a, uh, 1A, 5A. This was the printf uh, for, um, for, for the OK, access granted. And uh, we want to avoid something. And this was at 4760. OK, then. We hopefully uh, find something and uh, just print um, the result. Uh, there are many different um, possibilities of doing so, but this is good. Mm, yes. So uh, the only thing is we have to cast it to bytes that it's um, that we can uh, read it afterwards just for presentation. Good. That should be everything. Then um, let's run it. Then it was the solver. Let's see what happens. We get a lot of memory warnings. This is fine. It's just about the memory model. Um, it will work. <laughs> yeah, it now yeah, uses the symbolized input to, to build all the possible path. Uh, if it comes by this uh, avoid, it will just uh, cancel this path and go for the next one. In most cases, it will run into a void, of course, because only one input value is correct. And we get a result. Um, so it's starting at the four, so anger management. Let's see if this works. Yes. So it was able uh, to get yeah, through this. And it's, it's actually quite fast. So it's just a few lines of code, and it was running for maybe 30 seconds um, with manual analysis of all these uh, 14 different um, checks. It will maybe take you a few hours. With this, quite, quite easily solvable. OK. Let's look at identifying known algorithms. Um, as I said before, uh, we often don't know how algorithms are actually implemented uh, in code. So searching for a concrete implementation, so for example, the sequence of instructions, usually will fail and yeah, doesn't work. So the challenge is we want to search for functionality that can be implemented in many, many different ways. Um, we can have compiler optimizations that make totally differently looking code we can have code obfuscations that make code artificially more complex, and so on. Um, so using syntactic um, identification is good for uh, detecting um, plagiarism. So uh, if someone just took code and uh, added it to or added it to, a, to another project, but it's not good for finding for, uh, algorithms. And um, yeah, there are a lot of um, approaches in the literature, in the scientific literature, that uh, try to do comparison of, of basic blocks, so the smallest um, possible uh, blocks of code uh, where the um, control flow gets in uh, at the beginning and out uh, at the end. Um, 
I think, again, it's not robust enough against uh, code obfuscation. So, for example, there are code obfuscation that's, that merges blocks and splits them up. And, of course, then you can't compare uh, individual blocks anymore. And you have a lot of false positives with this kind of, um, of approaches because sometimes blocks are so small that they look the same. But in reality, yeah, it's just, just a small part of the functionality that, yeah, by coincidence, look the same, but, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not copied. And uh, a syntactic uh, comparison of, of entire functions also usually uh, doesn't, doesn't work because, yeah, the differences are too big, for example, depending on which compiler optimization you use. So, for example, you can't read the code, but you can see only the control flow and uh, the number of instructions. This is basically the same algorithm. It's a domain generation algorithm in a malware. Uh, they look uh, totally different. So with the syntactic uh, comparison, you, you wouldn't be able to find anything. And this is just optimization level one and three of the same compiler. So this, this can't work in, in, in practice. So the idea uh, is now we want to do semantic um, identification. So we know how the algorithm works, but we don't know how it is implemented. So we search for the functionality and not for the uh, actual implementation. It's much more robust against uh, all these optimizations, obfuscations, different architectures and everything. And the challenge is now how, how to describe functionality. So we can uh, look at the impact on the runtime environment. So what, what does it on the network, for example? Uh, how does it read or write to the file system and stuff like that? This is often done in, in malware research. So for example, you have these malware sandboxes. And uh, with these sandboxes, it's possible to um, yeah, observe what it does to the environment. And with this, we were able to identify malicious behavior. Um, you can also look at memory access patterns. Might be different with different implementations, but often they are quite similar. And what we did is input-output behavior. So we looked at algorithms we knew with a certain input, we will get deterministically a certain output, and with this we identify the functionality. This was also done uh, dynamically, so uh, dynamic sem semantic identification. There was a paper on this uh, in 2012. Uh, they were running uh, programs, recorded the traces, and then looked at input by output behavior of, um, of um, functions. And yeah, with this, they were able to identify, for example, an AES encryption algorithm. Problem uh, with this, of course, is hidden functionality will stay hidden because it's, it's a dynamic approach. So you run the program and uh, everything uh, that is executed gets captured, uh, other things not. Our approach on this, we call it uh, SIM-ID, so simila similarity uh, identification. So uh, we use, um, again, anger, but in a way that we uh, run it um, simulated, so with concrete values instead of uh, symbolic ones. So we are not really interested in finding all the possible path, but we're interested in running each and every function in the program uh, with um, specific inputs and look at the outputs. And with this, we want to identify, um, yeah, concrete implementations uh, of functionality. We know how it, how it works. Of course, we need a simulation model for this. So we simulate the program. We, we don't really uh, run it, or we simulate just uh, individual functions. And uh, what Anger does in the background, it, it translates the program code into the VEX um, intermediate representation from another um, open source project. It's a risk-like uh, language. It's architecture independent, so you can um, yeah, lo load uh, many, many different uh, binaries from, from different architectures in there. And um, external library calls, so for example, into the libc, they are replaced uh, by so-called sim procedures. This is just a Python code that does a simulation of what it would do uh, in, in the libc. Um, Basically, we, we, did, we did our research, we tried to identify uh, functions when we're not able to, to find them. We looked at the problems, we found some um, in, uh, incompleteness in the models of anger, 
not really surprising because yeah, it's uh, a model is never as good as the reality or not uh, complete. Um, we uh, gave them back to the project. So for example, added a SIM procedure for STP copy that didn't exist in the project. And with this, uh, our L algorithm, our SIM ID was then suddenly able to, to identify uh, additional uh, functionality. So basically, what, what do we do? We have uh, a domain generation algorithm as an example. These are these algorithms in malware that generate the domains that are then used uh, to, uh, yeah, to contact as a, con a command and control server. And uh, they are generated um, periodically. And uh, of course, they're not hard coded in the programs because then uh, it would be easy to block them for the future, but with these uh, complex domain ge generation algorithms, it's difficult to, uh, to calculate them all, all in advance. And the idea is now we know that uh, with uh, a certain input, uh, we are able uh, to uh, get a certain output, the next domain. And this is uh, deterministic, and with this we are able to identify this algorithm in, uh, in binaries. So basically, yeah, we have the input values, some algorithm, we don't know how it works, and we get a return value. And if we send it known input values that lead to known output values, and we have this combination of input-output values, then we found um, this domain generation al algorithm, no matter how it is actually implemented. And um, we now run it. It's a, it's a recorded uh, run of this on some heavily obfuscated uh, binaries. We'll show you this in a moment. And it basically looks like this. Again, we can ignore all <laughs> the, the problems with functions that are not uh, simulatable. Um, you can see that the functions that get um, executed or simulated, we're now at 15 out of 83. And in most cases, they're not, they not runnable or they uh, return something completely different, of course, because they don't expect these input values that we send them. But we, we don't care. If they can't work with them, then it's not the function uh, we're looking for. Now we are through around half of the functions. And what you can see here now is we have two uh, candidate functions that are found. The one is, um, call, is an un unnamed uh, function sub something. And the other one is called generate domain. That's actually the one uh, we were looking for. In these two functions, uh, when we send the correct input values, we get this domain name, this quite long .org domain out. And this is exactly the algorithm uh, we're looking for. The question is, why are there two candidate functions found? I will come to this in a moment. There's one, one challenge with this. This is function prototypes, so it would be good to not call all of the functions, but only the ones that um, um, take uh, the, the input values, the number of input values, the types uh, that, that we want to send to the function. Uh, the problem is uh, they are not stored in the binary explicitly, and we have to, um, yeah, basically ask, ask Anger to, to give us the function prototypes, and this is not very accurate uh, in Anger and all of the other tools. So what we do is uh, we accept false positives and just do it with all of the functions instead of the ones that have the correct function prototype because, yeah, we want to, to have false positives instead of false negatives, and uh, so that, that, we, that we're sure we, we, we checked all of the functions. And we did this with, uh, with a fake malware that we implemented uh, that contains this algorithm. Um, it's a domain generation algorithm of a real malware. Um, built this program with different compilers. So we used GCC, CLang, but also things like Tendra, CompSir, TinyCC, all these strange uh, small compilers, different architectures. And um, yeah, different obfuscators. So we use the obfuscator LLVM that uh, adds obfuscation inside LLVM, and uh, also Tigress, which is a, a C source code uh, obfuscator. Different obfuscations. So we substituted uh, code. Um, we changed the control flow complexity. We flattened the control flow entirely. Uh, we virtualized the entire program um, with some um, yeah. 
manually, uh, randomly crafted um, bytecode and added an interpreter. So the, the program, for example, this is the generate domain uh, function we have with the virtual, virtualizer. It, doesn't contain any single uh, line of the original program because this is just interpreter of the uh, virtualized code. And the result is still that in all uh, 31 uh, examples, this can be found. Uh, it takes around one hour, 20 minutes on, on, a, on a desktop computer. Most of the samples are analyzed within minutes. Uh, virtualization is something that is really slow. It's also slow when you, when you just execute it and um, yeah, it takes up to 30 minutes. What we see is sometimes we see um, double function entry points. This is what's exactly what you saw before, that there are two candidate functions. This was basically the same function. Um, something like this happens in anger to be two functions. So uh, the one function entry point is the push, and the knob before that is also an entry point for a function. Of course, it's the same function, and you, if you jump or if you call this, um, this knob, nothing happens and you go to the function anyway. So this is a problem of the underlying um, yeah, framework, but still, um, we don't really care. We found the, uh, the, the, the functionality and then you can do manual analysis on this later on. So to conclude this, um, symbolic execution and a special case of this program simulation where you use the symbolic execution engine with concrete values um, are two very, very important uh, semantic uh, aware analysis, analysis concepts where you can do a static analysis of code, uh, find where you don't have coverage problems, where you find uh, hidden functionality. And um, yeah, you can use different properties of code uh, to find them with these uh, two uh, methodologies. So program flow dependence and reachability problems inside control flow graphs and known input be output behavior can help you to identify functions. Of course, there is computational overhead, can be quite significant, uh, but you can work against this uh, by um, yeah, having manual analysis first and then making the, the computational problem smaller, for example, by reducing the complexity uh, of, the, of, the, of the constraints uh, or add constraints to reduce the complexity, uh, and de define input values, uh, define where you jump into the program, not at the beginning, uh, call uh, functions individually and so on to make this much less time consuming. And yeah, this actually works in practice now quite well and uh, is absolutely usable for finding uh, hidden functionality. So thank you for your attention and if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was wondering specifically about the, uh, on slide 29, you talked about these three products that were analyzed, uh, IoT products, cameras, and so on. And uh, it's, it sounds tempting to analyze these products uh, with sort of automatically, but then I think there, there's one tricky part, uh, which is that the, the firmware is not always available for you easily, right? You will spend a lot of time getting the firmware um, some of the, the vendors are only encrypting the firmware. They are not giving you sort of like nicely the download of the firmware so that you can analyze it. Uh, specifically the ones that are actually intending to hide something in there, right? Uh, because then they could already uh, put it on in the documentation, which I'm wondering like when you refer to the, uh, to those um, pre-configured secrets, it sounded almost like that's an easy provisioning mode uh, type of style uh, rather than a backdoor. Um, but do you think there's an alternative approach of tackling this ecosystem so that vendors are encouraged to, um, on a more positive side, to improve the security of IoT devices? So not make any sort of obvious mistakes like hard-coded yeah. passwords, etc. I think it's always difficult because security costs money. <laughs> and uh, of course, nobody's, uh, if you look at uh, 
all of these cheap uh, IoT devices um, that, you could, that you can buy, you clearly see that uh, they, they should just work and security is a very low uh, priority in this. Um, yeah, for forcing vendors into yeah, providing a, a base level of security would would make sense, but um, this has to be done yeah on yeah on, on a regulatory uh, level. Um, I mean uh, the EU um, works towards uh, towards such things um, on, on on many in many areas at the moment. So I can I can yeah think of that this is something that we maybe have in a few years. Uh, yeah, that, that we have this, this foundation level that is required to, to sell these products, for example, in Europe. But yeah, this extracting firmware from the devices, this is uh, a separate challenge and a big challenge, of course, yeah. So there are many different ways of, yeah, sometimes the firmware um, is stored somewhere and transferred over the network, and you might be able to get it from the network. Sometimes you have to extract it directly from the devices. This is on a per device um, a challenge to itself. Um, you mentioned that there's an overhead on the analysis, of course, but is there a rough estimation on how large the overhead is? Is it like only feasible to analyze smaller programs or is it also feasible to like actually analyze large projects? Um, um, w w without manual analysis first and reducing the problem, you, you get into computational overheads that are not feasible anymore quite fast. So it, it really depends on, um, on w w what you do first to reduce the complexity. So uh, the, the example I showed you with this uh, key generator program, that, that's a really small program. It works out of the box. We, we just had this one avoid statement, but um, usually, you, for example, it doesn't make sense to jump uh, to the initial state because th there will be so much at the beginning that will create so much overhead that, that, it, doesn't, um, that it doesn't feasible. But if, if you look at the, um, the control flow of a program, you, you load it in a disassembler, and for example, you see that there is, there's a branch at the beginning of the program, maybe it was implemented as a switch statement that you have five different functionalities and you're only interested in one of them. Then, of course, you put all the other branches as avoids, reducing uh, the complexity by a factor of five. And uh, with this, you can uh, work towards, um, yeah, that, that it's feasible. But still, you have seen uh, this one uh, printer firmware. It ran for, for 700 minutes. And of course, they did optimizations and reduced the complexity first. Another problem is that you usually don't really see how far you are. So you run it, and you don't know, will it, will it uh, finish in a minute or in a year? So. <laughs> Usually, you, you, you have to do the manual analysis first and then have a strategy on, on, on how, to, how to analyze it. Hi, uh, thanks very much for this uh, overview and all the, even the live demo, that was great. Um, <clears throat> so last year, we had a talk on simple execution also, um, um, where um, a few things were presented, but uh, they were uh, talking about uh, some existing tools like Anger of this yeah. this type of, of tool, but they were also identifying some gaps uh, as to like how this could be useful on on smaller devices like microcontrollers of the diverse. I think they were working on Risk Five stuff, but they did a lot of work on on this adaptation. Like so. From your, uh, your your work you presented here, like do you see uh, is this like you know applicable as is on the type of devices on which uh, run Riot, so uh, Cortex M type of stuff or RISC V, and looking at like I don't know like um, yeah in line assembly and stuff like that, or is it like or is are there some adaptation work that is needed? Um, are there some gaps basically to uh, adapt it to uh, analyzing uh, Riot firmware and stuff like that? Yeah, so, so you mean different architectures or computer systems? 
Yeah, so um, I don't remember exactly what he was <laughs> talking about yesterday, but uh, last year, yeah. but uh, uh, they were finding it, for example, difficult to uh, analyze like inline assembly, the way it's used on okay. RISC-V uh, and, 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 and uh, Cortex-M and basically the embedded community in general. And yeah. so, so stuff like that, like other stuff too, I remember exactly, but like basically if you were to use that Propose using that to write on write firmware on Cortex M or 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 whatnot. Yeah. But but do you see any gaps or any things that would need like additional work? Or? Yeah. So, so it always depends on on how this translation to to the simulation model works. So this is this this Vex uh, intermediate language. It, it's from another project and it's quite mature, but still there are of course uh, language con uh, constructs that don't work. Um, it, it, it always depends on if you if you have included them or not. Uh, usually, it quite, works quite well, but we we found in in, in our so, so so our project um, was was basically so we had a paper on this, and one reviewer said, "Wasn't your." main contribution in this paper that you um, that you check the simulation model of anger and showed that it works correctly which is is, is a good <laughs> good way of seeing this because um, we, we basically knew that we will find this functionality if the model is correct and if all the language constructs we have uh, are correctly translated uh, inside inside anger and we found a few uh, problems there so not only the sim procedures that uh, didn't exist, but also obvious bugs uh, in, inside uh, this model. Um, and with, with going through this and basically having a deterministic algorithm that uh, is translated in a very complex way through the obfuscation, um, we were basically able to, to verify that the model works quite well for different architectures and different language uh, constructs and compilers and so on. But of course, it can never be complete. Um, so I um, heard of a project I read recently about a uh, software bill of materials, um, also with open source components, finding out which uh, are built into there. And um, is it also published in the paper, the connection to some like existing software modules where you know the firmware is already already in or... Yeah. If it's maybe not in yeah. no in, in this project we um, solely focused on uh, on this program simulation inside anger okay yeah. Yeah. all right yeah I'm actually changing my question piling on to this one because I think it nicely relates to my firm uh, earlier question about the the regulation now you see in some sectors uh, the need from government agencies that companies release uh, S-bombs, which are essentially describing what software you're running on the device. Yeah. So it looks to me like that your analysis could actually be quite handy because uh, if a company says, that's what we include, and you actually run your automatic test and verify, oh, actually, that's not quite true. Uh, you, uh, you say that you included AES, but instead you include uh, Cha cha poly. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you lied. Uh, now uh, you're guilty yeah. because there's also there has to be some double checking because otherwise people just upload random stuff, right? Yeah, uh -huh. absolutely. So uh, our, our need for, for for this kind of solution and the basic uh, the fundamental idea for this project was. Um, came from malware analysis. So we have hundreds of thousands of samples each day. We can't manual, uh, manually an analyze all of them, but uh, we can run it through automatic systems that tell us a little bit of, about the functionality. So I think there is an AES inside, or this, this could be classified as ransomware because there is a lot of crypto and stuff like that. Yeah, so getting a fast, high-level uh, description of the functionality. Of course, manual analysis is always necessary afterwards. 
and you can you can hide anything. So uh, a clear limitation of uh, of our SimID approach, for example, is um, you could split up the functionality in more than one function, or um, you can you can split up uh, the input value and not send it as as one variable to the function, and then it's then it's difficult for us to without manual analysis first to identify it. So yeah, it, it won't replace manual analysis, but uh, it will make it a lot of so 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 that the initial start of the analysis gets easier. So you don't start uh, at zero. Any more questions? In that case, uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>